Thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Dean Gear to begin the event. Well, thank you um, and welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm the, I have the honor of being the Ginny and Connor Searcy Dean of the College of Arts and Science. And my friend John Meacham is the Carolyn T and Robert M Rogers chair in the American presidency. And obviously we're just a few days out from the election. And what we thought we would do is I'd start kind of setting the, with the context of where the election stands right now. And then after kind of setting that out, mostly driven by, by the evidence that's uh, in front of us, uh, Professor Meacham will then uh, offer a few uh, observations. I won't be constrained by it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's good. That's, that's important. Um, so a couple of things to just to open up with that we have a country that's going through huge amounts of change in all different kinds of ways, whether we're talking about the racial protests, whether we're talking about the COVID crisis, whether we're talking about the economy, and even the political crisis that we're facing, lots and lots of change. But one thing that hasn't changed is the fundamentals in the election, that is the polling numbers in particular. Uh, Donald Trump continues to poll around the low to mid 40s in approval ratings. Um, as far as the race between Biden and, uh, and Trump nationally, that continues to be amazingly stable, anywhere from eight to 10 points. Occasionally you have a poll above 10, occasionally you have one below eight, but it's a story of stability that in all this turmoil, the numbers themselves seem to be really quite uh, stable. Things to note that are of, of things worth noting. Number one is that the polls so far have shown Biden usually above 50%. And that's really very important to cross that threshold because in this election, there's not gonna be the kind of third party vote that there was in 2016. There's probably about six points or so in the third party vote in 16, it's gonna be down to two or so. So Biden getting over 50 is, a, is a, big, a big plus. And Hillary Clinton, by the way, in 2016, was always in the mid 40s. Occasionally a poll would have her in the high 40s, but she tended to be in the mid 40s. So that's a big change. All the evidence is that we have high turnout, but it's really hard to know because so many people are doing early voting because of the COVID crisis. So it's a little hard to know how to read some of that data. But one piece of data that strikes me as important is that in Pennsylvania, in the early vote, we now know that 25% of the early vote are citizens who did not vote in 2016, but have decided to go to the polls in 2020. That's the kind of evidence that suggests it's gonna be in fact a high turnout uh, election. You know, if you take a look at where the candidates are visiting, uh, Kamala Harris is going to, Kamala Harris is going to uh, Texas. Uh, Pre Vice President Biden has been in Georgia. Uh, those are states that are expanding the electoral map for the Democrats. And Trump is very much about protecting his base. There's still, critical states of Pennsylvania and Florida, and they'll both seem reasonably close. But again, watch what the candidates are doing. Also pay attention to the fact that many Republican senators are carefully, but distancing themselves from Trump. Um, it's worth noting that a lot of internal polls on the Democratic side are being released. You're not getting many being released on the Republican side. Why? Because the polls contain some, some bad news. Um, this morning, I was reading the Cook Political Report, which is one of the most reputable kind of forecasting uh, organizations out there, you know, very driven by data, but also driven by information on the ground. And one of the best people at that is Amy Walter. And she wrote a column today where she moved Texas from being leaning Republican to toss up. And that thought, well, the, Republic, the polls are suggesting the map is expanding for Biden. And I wonder what the polls were doing in 16. And so I wrote Amy, and asked her, I said, my recall is that you guys were narrowing the, the uh, electoral map for Hillary Clinton in 16 at this time. Is my memory right? And she said, yeah, we've moved uh, uh, Michigan, for example, into toss up, which was a uh, move towards Trump. And so the polls are showing, if anything, stability, maybe a slight gain for, um, for Biden. I also reached out to a, a a friend of both John's and myself, uh, Fred Davis, who's a very respected, highly respected ad guy on the Republican side of the, of the aisle, so to speak. He worked in McCain. He's worked for other presidential candidates. He's working for Purdue in Georgia this year, and he's working for um, uh, Cornyn in Texas. 
And so I asked him, I said, what's happening in those states? I said, is and he thought maybe Cornyn would hang on, but he wasn't at all sure about Purdue. And then I asked him on, on email, I said, so is Biden going to win both Texas and Georgia? And he wrote back, I prefer to think of it as Trump losing Texas and Georgia, uh, which tells you uh, where he's thinking things are headed. Um, so, you know, the, the analogies to 2016 are always going to be there because 2016 polls, especially state polls in the Midwest, got it wrong. Um, there have been some changes in how we do surveys, and so there's probably more accuracy uh, in the polls. But, uh, of course, error could take place. But again, remember the stability of the polls, the fact that Hillary Clinton was mired in the mid-40s, uh, and that there was a lot of undecided vote out there, uh, which mostly went to Trump at the end of the campaign. There's very few people who are undecided right now, maybe three, four percent, and they'll probably break pretty evenly. Tradition would say they'd break towards Biden, but you know, at this point in time, who those people are isn't at all clear. So, instead of three or four percent, I thought you were going to say there are three or four people who are undecided. <laughs> I, well, that's the point. Um, you know, people have made up their minds, and they and they're and they're voting in record numbers. At least it looks like so. Right now, it's a very favorable map. Uh, for Biden doesn't mean that Biden's going to to win. I think the lesson from 2016 is one should always be be cautious. But there's a lot of indicators, and it's not just the polls. I mean, note the behavior of the of the Republicans themselves, and I think also look at the money. Um, the Democrats have plenty of money to spend, both at the senatorial and the presidential level, and they're spending it, and they're getting help from people like. Uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg as well, who's making investments in places like Florida and elsewhere. Um, so that's the overall uh, context. Uh, Professor Meacham, um, you have a few things to add about uh, your more insider view, so to speak. Well, <clears throat> I've talked. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've talked to um, some folks who have been doing a lot of uh, expensive and independent, uh, neither. Uh, Trump nor Biden campaign polling. Uh, they believe that if the election had been Tuesday, this last Tuesday, uh, it would have been a significant almost 400 uh, plus electoral college uh, Democratic victory. Uh, the caution, of course, is that four years ago today, uh, the New York Times uh, was reporting about the Comey uh, announcement. And uh, 52 years ago, uh, the uh, North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese bombing halt and the failure of those talks to, to unfold uh, also happened uh, 20 years ago. Uh, this was the night, Thursday night, when uh, the news of George W. Bush's DUI in Maine broke uh, from a Fox affiliate in Maine. And the Bush people continue to believe that that's what cost them the, the popular vote. So we're in the last 96 or 112 hours, whatever it is of this, and things could still change fundamentally. Um, to me, the great question here is, is this really the, an, an election that is unfolding in the demographically diverse America that is unfolding and taking shape? Or is it a reactive election? And I think that that's, uh, depending on what happens on Tuesday uh, and in the ensuing days, because it's not election night anymore, you know, it's more like election season, which by the way, is the way it was uh, for much of American history. Will we look at this election as one in which the country made a decision about the dispositions of tone that we want to have about changing questions of identity, culture, economics, globalization, or is it a more reactive one, uh, which is what 2016 was quite explicitly, right? This is not in any way a partisan remark, Donald Trump, ran for president on the slogan to make America great again. And that greatness uh, was a nostalgic uh, push as opposed to a more future oriented one. The other remarkable thing that neither John nor I have mentioned going on uh, 11 minutes is the fact that we are suffering from a potentially crippling pandemic. 
And the last election that unfolded amid a pandemic was in 1920, exactly 100 years ago. 675,000 Americans died from the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919 uh, into, into 20. And in that election, the incumbent party, Woodrow Wilson was not running again. Uh, he's finishing his eighth year, but uh, the Cox Roosevelt ticket, young Franklin Roosevelt uh, was the vice presidential candidate, ran against uh, that mighty juggernaut of Harding and Coolidge. And the juggernaut of Harding and Coolidge destroyed the Democratic Party. Uh, John and I were just geeking out earlier, looking at the old map. And the Democratic Party only carried the Deep South in 1920. It was a landslide election for the opposition party in reaction to an incumbent administration that fairly or unfairly had been in power during a war uh, during, uh, and during a pandemic. And the question for voters before them was, do you want to change the story? Do you think that rehiring this party that had uh, not responded to the pandemic in an effective way uh, was the right, right thing to do, or did you want to have a change? And I think, as, as John was alluding to, I think in any sort of remotely ordinary universe, uh, we would be talking about uh, a coming Biden landslide. At least we would be calling him the front runner. And one of the really interesting things is the, right, the correctly, the lessons in humility that were learned in 2016 have actually come into being. Uh, people are much more careful and they should be. We always should have been. I think that's actually a good thing here. Um, to me, the most fascinating thing is, among the most fascinating things, is not so much why uh, Biden is ahead, but what it tells us about the resilience of the support for the president. His numbers really haven't moved much uh, throughout the four years. So what is it? about his worldview that is so, has such enduring appeal to uh, his core of supporters. Because let me tell you, this one you can uh, take to the bank. If Joe Biden wins cleanly uh, without a huge dispute, and we'll talk about that in a second next week, the organized opposition, the perpetual 24-7 absolute uh, machinery of conflict that will attempt to portray the incoming administration as a socialistic undertaking uh, in the tradition of the Bolsheviks will begin within 30 seconds or perhaps during the announcement of that news. And that will be the persistent narrative that will unfold every hour of every day of an incoming administration. It's going to be very interesting to see to what extent the, a, a new administration's governing decisions will be affected by that perpetual opposition. Now, if you're on the other side of the fence, you'll say, but there's been perpetual opposition to President Trump. And that's absolutely true. So that's one of the things we have to ponder is we live in a perpetual tsunami of organized conflict. Politics in, in a more ordinary sense, and I don't mean ordinary in a pedestrian, but just in, a, in the way that is more familiar, is the mediation of differences in an attempt to find a temporary solution to the problems of the age, to manufacture that consensus, and to continue to test that consensus against shifting public will. That's what politics is. <clears throat> and people have been talking about this and debating this since Aristotle. Uh, 
John actually was in school with Aristotle. Uh, they used to uh, play rugby together. Um, so I think we, one of the things we have to face and one of the things that particularly informed and engaged folks like you all have to think about is what's the disposition of citizenship? What's our body language of citizenship going forward? Is it that if you are a Republican who believes in this hypothetical uh, socialistic conspiracy, uh, is it to oppose the incoming administration no matter what? Or is it to oppose them when they do something or propose something that you don't believe in? And are we willing as a country at this particular point in the 21st century to keep a mind open enough to think that even the people with whom we fundamentally disagree have the capacity to have a worthy idea and pursue that objective. And this is not theoretical in this case because the public health crisis, which is creating a structural economic shift and potentially uh, I think a, a cultural impact that we haven't quite fully reckoned with, including institutions of higher learning. John and I and two of our colleagues are teaching about 700 students. I've enjoyed it, but I haven't enjoyed it anywhere near as much as I would if we could go over there two days a week and actually create the commerce of ideas that you can do in a room. And so, but in the fact that we can't is to some extent addressable by public policy. And one side has made a decision about how seriously to take the virus and the other side is making a different argument. And it's easy to take a different argument when you don't have the responsibility to execute it. But we are gonna face, all of us are gonna face a significant test beginning very soon, which is do we have the cultural, political, and I would even argue personal capacity to admit that somebody you don't like has a good idea. And I think in a lot of ways that's, that's on the ballot. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the things, and, and John and I have talked about this in a number of different quarters, and of course, you know, American politics is polarized, um, and what John just indicated documents that, that is people decide out of the gate that they don't like an idea, even though they haven't necessarily thought about it much because the authorship, the author of that idea is illegitimate in their minds, and they make those decisions based on ideology, which is an understandable kind of cue, set of cues that you can use. But one of the things that I think these kinds of conversations, plus the broader mission of higher education and Vanderbilt's mission in general, is to put that type of decision making to the side and really introduce evidence to the uh, conversation and use evidence, historical evidence as well. And I would say the thing that I worry about most about the shift in American politics isn't the rise of the right or the left or anything like that, it's that we've become untethered by evidence, that we're making arguments that based on ideology rather than what the facts say. And that's you, troubling. Can I tell you a story about that? Yep. Um, so this is not about, this, Trump is a, manif a great manifestation of this, uh, but it didn't start with him. So exactly 10 years ago, uh, so John Kerry was becoming the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, after, I think in 10, 11, <clears throat> you can check me on these dates. Uh, it was about the 10th anniversary, we were approaching the 10th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan. It was also a long, a 50 year anniversary, I guess, of uh, the Fulbright Committee hearings, right? Where William Fulbright of Arkansas led a very important series of hearings into the course of the war in Vietnam. It helped shift opinion. It was at that committee, actually, that John Kerry, as a young man, you may remember, 
had testified and said, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? Um, and as Senator Kerry was coming into the chairmanship, it occurred to me that it was probably a good thing for the country to have a serious suprapartisan look at the success, the failures, the lessons of Afghanistan as the first front in the war on terror. And, and that Kerry would be the perfect person to look at it, having been a presidential nominee, having testified before the Fulbright Committee, coming into this chairmanship. And so I was gonna write a column. I did write a column saying we should have a new set of Fulbright hearings. You could call them the Kerry hearings, you could call them whatever you wanted. But I thought there would be a moment, uh, there was a great opening for a kind of national classroom experience about this projection of force and how effective it was. And so I called Senator Kerry to tell him I was about to do this. And he said, I can't do it. And I, being an ace journalist biographer, said, why? Bob Woodward, right here. Uh, and he said, because there's no common fact set. Even a, even a set of Senate hearings would become so, as to use John's term, so polarized that I couldn't get two expert witnesses to testify about the different extrapolations from certain facts because they would not agree on the underlying facts. And I try not to be hyperbolic. I don't always succeed, but I try. But it kind of took my breath away that the world's greatest deliberative body, the body that was created by the founders to be most removed, including the presidency, from the people so that we would have a sphere in which to deliberate as opposed to simply react viscerally was incapable of shedding light on what is now our longest war. And it, I wasn't saying it was an, an anti-war thing. I just I wanted to know as a citizen, uh, how's it going? What have we accomplished? You know, has it successfully, I mean, self-evidently, we've not been hit again, but what's the connection between our projection of force and that? Because what is the role of history, if not to shed light on where we are and what we should do? It seemed to me to be a kind of patriotic undertaking. And John Kerry, and believe me, there is not a single United States senator who has ever declined to have something that would put them on television every day. That had never happened before. Just said, no, we can't. And so that was a decade ago. And I would argue that it's even worse. We saw it with the um, uh, Judge Barrett's nomination. The Democrats weren't in the room. That hasn't been remarked on much. But the Democrats from the Senate Judiciary Committee didn't even come to vote against it. And so, and that was, I don't get sad about these things a lot, but that sort of made me think, talk about a system that needs rejuvenation and reform. Yeah, yeah, the, the Barrett thing, in fact, there's been a series of questions about the Barrett um, nomination and what effect it may or may not have on the election. Uh, I don't think it has much effect, partly because despite Democratic unhappiness, uh, the, her nomination, she's qualified. And that you know, that took a lot of the, you know, took the conversation a different direction when, when previous nominees haven't necessarily been as qualified as, as she has been. I suspect, if anything, Barrett probably hurt the Republicans a little bit because it kept them off message and trying to change the narrative for the election. But, you know, it, it, it just went quietly. And I think partly because the Democrats protested in various ways, but they also didn't want to hand an issue to, uh, to Trump and the Republicans as well. But I don't know if you agree with that, uh, Professor Meacham. I think that what the uh, one of the realities, and this goes to what I was saying at the at the top, one of the realities is opposition is easier. Opposition is more emotionally and organizationally fulfilling. 
Uh, and so in an odd way, and I don't know how much the president actually understands or believes in the Federalist Society's mission, uh, but that was a 40 to 50 year victory for the conservative judicial wing of the country. In a way though, it probably has put more people voting for Biden in the early voting lines because than conservatives because conservatives conservatives just got what they wanted, right? Yeah. This is true. I, I dealt with this all the time with George H.W. Bush. His greatest achievements were always keeping bad things from happening. And it's very hard to go out and say, I didn't have a nuclear war after the Berlin Wall <laughs> fell, you know, just the public mind banks your successes without necessarily crediting you with them. And it's the prospect of something that is often more motivating than the reward for it. And I think that interestingly, uh, in pure electoral terms, leaving, a, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the long-term effects on jurisprudence, but in raw political terms right now, uh, in an odd way, it might have helped Republican turnout if that seat were open. Yep, I think that's, yeah, we've, we have seen, for example, the, the Barrett, uh, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the nomination of Barrett, it had a couple effects. It looks like it's stimulated turnout among Democrats. And the other thing is it increased fundraising. Yeah. Um, the Democrats are awash in money. Um, you know, nobody would have predicted that you know, a year ago or heck, nine months ago, people were talking about how Biden would have no money and that Trump would just crush him financially. And that's just the opposite. Biden has a lot of money to spend and, and Trump is trying to navigate a very constrained budget, which will be a very interesting story to tell about how that unfolded. That'll have to wait till after. after Obviously, election. can't afford buses in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah well, that's true too. Um, so... I, you know, a couple of people have been asking uh, some lots of different questions. Um, and so one of the things that has come, one question that's come up is, is basically the question is, what's a mandate? Um, and so one of the things that I will say that on election night, let's say that there is a winner or two days later, whatever the case may be, whoever's the winner, that politician, that candidate, whether it be Trump or Biden, will claim a mandate. Um, now, whether it's actually a mandate is a, is a bigger issue because, because the vote itself contains just basically one piece of information that you like one candidate more than the other. It doesn't mean you like that candidate. There are many people in this country who are gonna be voting for Biden not because they like Biden, but because they dislike, they like dislike Trump. So they're really voting against Trump. They're not giving Biden a mandate um, to do what he wants. They just want to stop stop Trump. And so the actual vote itself, it's very hard to tease out uh, what a mandate is. Now, if in fact Biden wins by a substantial amount, then it becomes more credible. But even after the 2000 election, which was tight as it could possibly be and was controversial and was finally settled with. Uh, George W. Bush winning the presidency, he went on to claim a mandate, even though he didn't even win the popular the popular vote. So politicians are very good at it. Journalists are also, on average, not very good at sorting out what a mandate is, because they try to figure out, they just use the vote totals, and the vote totals are messy indicators. Um, following the 80 election, uh, the news media, because they were so surprised by how big Reagan won, they said Reagan had a mandate. Again, it was probably more of an anti-Carter vote that led to Reagan's win, um, but they'll claim that. And so one of the things we really wanna pay attention to is whatever the outcome is, is what exactly is the interpretation of the election, both by the politicians themselves and particularly the leading candidates and then the journalistic community. Um, and if it's a big win, let's say that Biden wins by a lot, there'll certainly be a lot of claims about mandate, but you've gotta be careful about some of those interpretations um, as we go forward. Well, what happens is, you know, and, the, and the, the 1980 thing is also about the surprise of the Republican control of the Senate. Yeah. The first time they'd won the Senate since Thermopylae, right? Uh, so it had been a long time. Um, 
so that what history tells us about this is do the house margins go so if biden wins do the house margins go up significantly and does the senate flip and how how much does it do so and so you're going to have the mandate is proportional to not simply the presidential margin but the institutional elections as well but every piece of history uh and but I'll, I'll start 60 years ago so i don't put everybody to sleep is that when there's one party government there is almost always within 24 months a significant reaction uh it happened in 1964 uh, when Johnson won so big, 1966, Republicans had a marvelous year. Ronald Reagan became governor of California, and the reaction set in. Uh, 1992, the Democrats do very well. 1994, the Republicans win the Congress back for the first time in 40 years, and George W. Bush becomes governor of Texas, and the reaction sets in. Uh, 2010, uh, I'm sorry, 2008, President Obama, one party rule, 2010, by 2010, the Tea Party's moving uh, and you have a reaction. So there's something about, at least un unto this hour, American politics that bounces us from guardrail to guardrail. And I, I don't think we've suspended all political laws of the road. Uh, and I think that the great, one of the great subjects of conversation. So let us say hypothetically, as John just said, that Biden wins the presidency. There's not a huge fight in the courts and all that. We can talk about that again. Um, Speaker Pelosi gets a slightly bigger majority and the Democrats win the Senate. Vice President, President elect Biden's biggest problem arguably is not going to be from the right, but from the left, because there are going to be a, so many progressives who will feel so liberated that President Trump is gone, that they are going to want to do everything at once. And as John says, claiming a mandate. And that's a big fear, I think, <clears throat> and an anxiety, a worry that's driving a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine, who don't love President Trump, but who don't want uh, all democratic rule. And we could debate the logic of that for the, the rest of the year, but, that, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a reality. It's a genuine concern on the part of folks. What I would submit, if you're thinking that way though, is you don't really, you, you have to take Biden into account. Uh, and Joe Biden is a center to center left guy. Uh, it may be that the most interesting political conversations we have over the next year will be about the tension not between Biden and the right, but Biden and the left. And that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. The, uh, because I'm a nerd and I like data, uh, the guardrail, the guardrail thing is absolutely the case. We have basically turnover of parties every eight eight years. It's actually 8.2 if you really want to calculate the mean, which I like to do. Um, so I've had a little nerdy, nerdy moment. Um, the point three was for you, John. Huh? The point three was for you. Well, I just want to say to everybody so they can begin to order it. Uh, when Dean Gear writes his memoir, it's going to be calculating the mean. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, and hopefully not the regression to the mean. Um, so so that there is this cadence of American politics. What is interesting about the Trump campaign is that normally a president who has been elected in a change of parties, so the Republicans took over in 16, they usually get two terms. That in fact, in a case, the course of American history over the last 150 or so years, it's only happened once where you've had a change in parties and that president has only served one term and that individual is Jimmy Carter. Uh, George. H.W. Bush had served four years on the heels of eight years of republicanism so that you had a desire for change. That's what makes this election particularly important and particularly unusual because you, you tend not to have these types of situations because you could have expected a Trump re-election. But Trump ran a campaign that, or ran a presidency premised on two things as he approached 2020. One was a growing economy 
and the, which it was growing. It's not the greatest in American history, as he claims, but it was clearly growing. And second, that he was going to be able to run against Bernie Sanders, which was a which wasn't quite Hillary Clinton, as good as Hillary Clinton for him, but pretty close. And then by early March, both of those things were gone. The economy was in a free for all, and all of a sudden, Joe Biden, who is not Bernie Sanders, and who has made that point countless times, is now the nominee. And so the two pillars of the Trump campaign crumbled in a matter of weeks. And he's really not recovered from that fact um, because his base only strategy was going to work in a very close election where he could basically demonize the other side. In fact, one of the, again, one of the facts, if you accept polls as facts, which I certainly do, is that Biden's popularity has increased over the course of this campaign. Not dramatically, but it's increased a little bit, despite the pounding from from the uh, from Trump and the Republicans, you know they tried to attack him as out of touch. You know he's shown up at these debates and he's not shown himself to be out of touch. He's done town halls. He's not shown himself to be out of touch. So that narrative went out the window. Um, trying to attack him as on the left, you know, that's what they would have done if it was Bernie Sanders. But he's not Bernie Sanders. He has a long track record of being a very mainstream, moderate, maybe moderate to left Democrat, and that, that record is is there. Um, and so all the effort, all the, the core of the campaign got upended for Trump in early March, and he's just not found any footing. But the problem is, and this is where campaigns are not just things you can make up, you do have to stay, uh, you are constrained by the evidence. I'm sure that Trump is touting, which was released today, the, you know, the economy is coming back. And if I were him, I'd be touting the growth in the GDP in the third quarter without a doubt. It was 33%. That's pretty amazing. But of course, it's 33% on the previous quarter, which was unprecedented drop. So the percentage itself is somewhat misleading. We still have 750,000 unemployment claims that came in this last week. Lots of data, but, but those facts are driving the politics as well. Plus the fact that the COVID cases, unlucky for Trump in this case, are rising really fast in a lot of key battlegrounds like Ohio, Iowa, uh, Wisconsin. And those things people pay attention to. Um, and so it'll be really fascinating to watch how he can do it. But Trump has been dealt, you know, he's been lucky in a lot of different ways. And he certainly pulled an inside straight in 2016. But the pandemic, while providing him a huge opportunity for leadership, um, has recast the campaign in ways that he never thought of and has put him at a, dis, a disadvantage um, and has not given him the hook by which he could call back to at this point in time, at least. And so stuff can happen over the next hundred and 12 hours, so to speak, um, to call back. There is another problem that's facing the Trump campaign is that so many votes have already been cast that now you're talking about dealing with a much smaller piece of the electorate that you can move. Um, and also just to, again, for the nerdy moment, people should pay close attention to Florida and to North Carolina because both of those states are counting their early votes by election day. And so that if, for example, both Florida and North Carolina happen to go for Biden, even if a lot of states still aren't called, that's probably game over for the president. It's, I do not see how you can win the Electoral College, given the landscape right now, if you don't win Florida. Um, but, you know, Florida is hard to predict, and I wouldn't want to call that state right now. But even if Florida does go to the Republicans, there's still many paths forward for, for Biden. Uh, Biden looks strong in, in Arizona. In fact, Jonathan Martin, who's somebody we had come to our class, who's a lead reporter for the New York Times, did a, uh, maybe it was just a tweet, but he did a piece talking about Georgia's more likely to flip than Florida to the Democrats. That's interesting. Um, and certainly the, the speech that uh, uh, Pre Vice President Biden gave in Warm Springs, Georgia, which was symbolically uh, great stuff because of FDR's time there as he tried to recover from, from polio, another virus. Um, so I think all these you know, these structural features are really important. And I think Trump was not anticipating this kind of a campaign. And, you know, he, he didn't like it and he flailed against it. There was actually probably a path forward where he could have embraced the pandemic in a way that would have given him a platform that would have yielded success. And I also think that Biden, you know, Biden would have had a harder time winning this, camp, winning this election without a pandemic because it gave voice to the kinds of, his ability to be empathetic, uh, to talk about bringing the nation together. Um, he, you know, Biden has gotten in some sense, uh, had some real breaks in his way as the campaign has unfolded. Um, 
So let me take, let's look for some more um, questions. We've covered a number of them in directly and indirectly. Um, John, I think I saw a question that I should answer. I saw that too, so go for it. Uh, read the question for me. Oh, okay, well, I'm gonna have to pull that up. Um, where is that? Ah, uh, here it is. Can you explain your comments on MSNBC calling D Donald Trump supporter, supporters lizard brains? Fabulous question. Uh, the first thing is I didn't say that. Uh, and I refer you to the, <clears throat> the live uh, re recording. Uh, here's what happened uh, last week. Uh, I went to the Biden-Trump uh, debate here in Nashville. Uh, I was at Belmont uh, across the way from, from campus. Uh, took my 12-year-old daughter. Uh, we were sitting way in the back. Uh, and in the hall, I have to tell you, I thought President Trump won the debate. Uh, it was, he kind of owned the room and was spoke clearly, at least stylistically clearly, uh, threw a lot of charges uh, and made a lot of points that I don't think, at least again, in the room, it played as if Vice President Biden was not responding uh, as forcefully as he might. And it was, a kind of emotional uh, ownership of, a, of, of the setting. Uh, I drove home uh, and actually I was texting with John and others, uh, not while driving, but you know, a, a, along the way. And then I had a, a conversation with Brian Williams uh, just after midnight Eastern time. And what I was trying to say, perhaps unsuccessfully, was that there is an elemental case for Trump. There is a part of the country that believes in him kind of no matter what. And I think that that is supported by data. It's supported by experience. And the line I said was, Donald Trump is a product of the angry and anguished white guy's lizard brain by which I meant, it's the popular phrase, Carl Sagan popularized it. It's the stem of the brain where our primitive emotions are. And then you move forward in the brain to, to higher thinking and, and, and all of that. Uh, it was a vivid way of putting it. If I had said what I usually say, which is something like there is an elemental appeal, none of you all would have thought, no, followed what I was saying, which is what I usually do. Uh, but I believe it. I believe that Donald Trump, more uh, than his opponent, and certainly more than Secretary Clinton four years ago, appeals to anxieties about identity and culture and the nature of the country for a lot of folks who look like me. And as a sign of, that is not to say that everybody who's for Trump uh, is reacting purely emotionally, but a lot of people are. And I absolutely insist on that. And I believe that the facts back me up. What's interesting about this story is that on Friday night, I've said it, no one paid any attention, of course. Uh, Friday night, uh, my old friend, uh, Laura Ingram, uh, put up on the screen on Fox, Meacham calls Trump supporters lizard brains, which again, I had not in fact done. But in the shorthand of this machinery of perpetual conflict, I was useful to Fox News on Friday night because it looked as though this elitist guy uh, was being condescending about Trump supporters and saying that if you were for the president, you were stupid. Again, not what I said. I'm a big boy. I've done this a long time. I understand. Um, I, I will say that when Fox takes off after folks in this way, it produces very ugly and very unsettling uh, uh, digital traffic. Uh, what I think we have to 
get to, and this is part of what informed my comments earlier, is a place where at least if we're going to attack each other, let's attack each other on the actual facts of what we said. Uh, and so, um, look, I voted for more Republicans for president than I have for Democrats. So I'm not some uh, crazy Trotskyite, you know, trying to uh, change your children's minds. Uh, I believe in an America that's uh, a consensus in many ways between Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. I believe that America is an Enlightenment era project. Uh, and one of the things I value so much about uh, the life of the mind and the life of institutions like this is that we have a chance for reason to play a role against passion. And the only thing I'm sorry about is by using a colloquial phrase as opposed to a scientific one, I, uh, I gave uh, the machinery of conflict uh, a frisson uh, and a, a chance to go after me. Yeah, well, th thank you, you know, John, for that. And it's, you know, it's just, it's the, you know, the time, I mean, disagreeing is part of politics and yet it becomes personal and it becomes nasty in ways that are unsettling to not only John, but his entire family, frankly. And so, and all his friends, I would add, including my, myself. Um, and this is part of the problem that we face that the country really needs to grapple with. And this is not a problem of the left or the right. It's a problem of both the extremes because people are not being tethered by evidence. People are just making stuff up as they go along. And one of the things that you know we kind of hope that this kind of forum provides is more of a discussion about that evidence and that universities themselves are committed to providing that evidence. And, and the irony is that if you're driven by evidence, both the historical record plus the existing record of, of evidence that might be available, you're gonna find that you're actually not very ideological, that you're gonna do things sometimes on the left because they're right. Sometimes you're gonna do things on the right because they're right. And sometimes you're just gonna be smack dab in the middle because moderation's right. And so, you know, evidence is a threat to people's ideological purity and that's the way it should be. And that's why reason is so important. And that's really the particular role that the university, a university like Vanderbilt can play that really is committed to providing both, you know, both sides. Um, there's a belief, which John kind of hinted at, that that, um, that you know faculty in general are all left wing, and that they are tend to be much more democratic, um, and that they're trying to you know affect the minds of uh, of your children and et cetera. We, trust me, we have no such influence. Uh, all of you have much more influence on your children. You had them for 18 years. Um, socialization is going to matter a heck of a lot, and not only does socialization matter, but genetics matter. And as I tell all the students, I said, not only are you going, you know, you think a lot like your parents, get ready, you're going to start looking like them. Um, and for my children, I feel truly bad about that. Uh, and I have apologized to them uh, for, for that legacy. Let me tell the, the, the uh, leadership story. I think this would be real. I, I don't know if I've said this publicly or not. Um, John and I and Bill Haslam, the Republic, former Republican governor of Tennessee, taught a class last fall, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and terrific class loved it even with gear involved it was good uh so we um i was talking early on and i said what i just said to you all but as a as a longer piece which was america is a product of the enlightenment uh that the the, the notion that uh society should be organized vertically uh, popes, princes, prelates, kings would have authority over all of us was shifting to a horizontal understanding because of the scientific revolution, because of the Protestant reformations, because of the sacred translation of sacred scripture into the vernacular, because of the European enlightenment, this role that reason could undo autocracy and that individual destiny could be determined by the individual. And that the American revolution was in many ways the fullest political manifestation of that shift from a vertical to a horizontal understanding of reality. And the class, many people in the class said, no, we don't believe that. We don't believe that the Declaration of Independence plus the Constitution are enlightened documents, enlightenment documents. And so I said, all right, don't believe me believe Frederick Douglass. 
And so I said, we assigned, uh, you know, William Lloyd Garrison in the middle of the 19th century thought the Constitution was a pact with the devil and that it was, it was irredeemable. Frederick Douglass believed it was redeemable. Abraham Lincoln ultimately believed that it was redeemable. And so we assigned some Douglas speeches, um, particularly Douglas on Abraham Lincoln, who said that Lincoln was not our friend in the beginning. He was preeminently the white man's president, but he liberated a people. And it's the best, if you haven't read it, uh, it's uh, 1876. Uh, it was the uh, speech that Frederick Douglass gave in memory of Lincoln at the dedication of the Freedmen's uh, Monument in Washington. It's the best meditation on the nature of biography and the possibilities and the limitations of human experience in a republic like ours that I've ever read. And so we signed it. About 10 days later, I think, I made some offhand remark about how Jefferson was being hypocritical when he bought Louisiana because of his anti-big government views. And the same folks who had said, no, we're not enlightened, raised their hand and said, but, but this is what politicians do. You have to just deal with reality as you find it. And I thought, honestly, my work is done. We could have ended the class. I mean this as honestly as we could have ended the class because we had turned, we had ex it turned their minds from reflexive reaction to what they heard the first time to reading great American texts that shifted their view and informed it with perspective and reason. It was the best pedago pedagogical moment I've ever had. And basically we, had a, we suddenly had a class of Reinhold Niebuhr's. I've never been happier. Um, that's what we're trying to do. That's exactly right. Um, so I was looking through the questions and uh, somebody asked who's in the picture here uh, that's in my background. Before I talk about that, the reason this picture is in my background is that I had done a video. This is a comment on the on the nature of our times. I'd done a video tied to uh, some ANS issue to, to alumni, and I did it at my home. And the background happened to be a, a picture, uh, a poster of Al Gore Lieb and Lieberman running in 20, uh, 2000. And people thought, oh, that's a sign of, of my being a liberal Democrat may or may not be true. Of course, I wish it had panned a little bit to the, to the left, ironically the left, because there was a, another po poster of Barry Goldwater and Bill Miller from 1964. And so I thought, well, the backgrounds these days matter more. So I happen to have a picture that I took many years ago with Newt Gingrich, Harold Ford, both a Republican and a Democrat, and somebody who looks somewhat like me, maybe from a few years back, uh, but is bipartisan. And it's a reflection of, uh, of trying to just show that, look, both sides have it right and uh, from time to time. And that's certainly the case. And, and I debated, I've also pictured myself with Bob Corker, who I think of as, as both a friend and someone who I really, really respect, our former senator, um, but decided that since it was both a Democrat and Gingrich and a Republican and uh, Harold Ford, I mean, a Democrat and Harold Ford that I'd uh, put that picture up. Um, but again, it's just a comment on the news media and a comment on the kinds of interpretations that go on by the public as well, because we're just so polarized that if you see a poster of, uh, of Al Gore from 2000, you kind of make assumptions about partisanship, though um, I even have a tie from Lamar Alexander and his, uh, his uh, plaid tie. Um, I love it. His memorial yeah. choices have never been great. Do you want a quick tour here? Do you want to do this? Yeah, yeah. All right, I think I can do this. All right, to go to John's point. So there's Lyndon Johnson. That's a portrait of John Lewis that has just been painted by a Nashville artist named Michael Shane Neal. The Nashville Portrait Gallery has just bought it. And that is a portrait painted by the 43rd president of the United States of his father. That was a thank you for eulogizing him. Um, so you try to figure that out, right? <laughs> and this is John's point here. There you go. So we go from Truman to Kennedy and Nixon to Reagan and Bush to Eisenhower to Carter to Nixon to Bush 
I think we may be the only people with portraits of Bill Miller. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, look, this is America, baby. I mean, we got to, you know, keep, you know, I wish both, I wish one side had a monopoly on virtue, then it'd be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, neither side does. Um, so we're getting some questions, uh, Professor Meacham, about predicting Tuesday's election. Um, and you had referenced earlier about one of the things that came out of 2016 was pundits and journalists and pollsters behave, being a little bit, uh, having a little more humility uh, because of the surprising results. And I think that still um, applies. I, the landscape right now is favorable to, to Biden. I think the context is favorable uh, to Biden. But maybe turnout works in a way that, in fact, uh, Trump uh, carries enough battleground states that he can be elected president. I don't think anybody believes that he can win the popular vote. Um, I have not heard anybody make that claim. There is one poll out, uh, the Rasmussen poll, that has it basically within two points or so for Biden with a two-point lead. The Rasmussen poll is problematic on a variety of different uh, fronts. I think they literally are polling to, to, to please Trump um, because their methodology is pretty suspect. But, but there's, you know, and then, then when a poll comes out, what was it? What was it? Was it CNN's poll that had like six weeks ago or uh, three weeks ago had Biden with a 16 point lead, which I thought was equally ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, you're going to get those, those outliers, you know, one way you know, one way or the other, but trying to predict the election um, be difficult. I think we'll learn a lot about where Florida goes. And even if Florida goes to Trump, but it's super narrow, you know, that's, that's not a, a, a dangerous sign. If Trump wins Florida by five, that's a problem for Biden. Because one of the things is our focus on the popular vote leads people to think, well, it's all about the electoral college. That's true, but there are national tides and right now, it looks like things have probably shifted on average across the states three to four points towards the Democrats. If that's true, that brings a whole bunch of states into the Democratic column. Um, and you know, we'll see if that if that plays that plays out. Things could change, but in 1980, things could change because you had a, uh, an incumbent who was well known, but the challenger wasn't as well known, and there were some doubts, and he'd answered those doubts, and so it led to change. I think people, you know, there's not any information that's going to come out about Biden. Um, maybe there's a DUI waiting to be found out in a trip that he took in Maine when he was in college, possibly like like uh, President Bush faced in 2000, but it seems un unlikely given his uh, how long he's been in the public eye and all the information that exists out out there. And you know, it doesn't matter what the issue is. The you know the Hunter Biden thing hasn't had any traction. I don't think. Um, uh, any of the other things have. This is a very stable election in midst of chaos, which is truly ironic. Um, I think the, the I think all that's right. Uh, so quickly, there is a scenario. My 18 year old son walked me through it last night, um, where you end up with uh, 269 to 269 uh, in the electoral college, which means it goes to the House of Representatives. Uh, depending on what happens on election day, uh, the um, it's the new house, not the existing house, that decides this. It would be in January. Uh, today, the Republican Party controls 26 of the 50 delegations. So Trump would win uh, the presidency if the election went to the House. He knows that, has talked about it. Uh, I know that Speaker Pelosi has is particularly focused on flipping a couple of seats that would get the delegations in a way uh, that would be more uh, congenial. The other thing to watch, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania, is if it's really close, if the administration chooses to sow chaos and doubt about the legitimacy of, of uh, non-traditional balloting, you could see Republican legislatures sending competing sets of electors to the Electoral College in the middle of December. And at that point, the system really is not equipped to handle it very well. Uh, the, uh, the House and the Senate have to meet 
uh, to decide which side of electors they then, uh, which set to take. Uh, they then adjourn and the Senate and the House in December would, would never agree. And there's a, a, a genuine uh, path to chaos there. Um, it feels a, like a de minimis risk, but there's a, a, a Loyola Law Review article uh, that I would commend to your attention. Um, sorry, I don't have the site with me, but if you Google uh, Lo Loyola Law Review Electoral College uh, 2020, it'll pop up. It's, it's a long piece, but really interesting. It walks into the 12th Amendment, the 20th Amendment, the 22nd. Um, and it's some of it reads like an Alan Drury novel, uh, but uh, better be prepared than not. Okay, well, we're at the end of our, our time. Obviously, to everybody, we appreciate you um, joining us. Um, the, this election has been fun and it will continue to be fun. Um, this probably this probably going to be 2024 will be boring by comparison, but that's probably be welcomed in some quarters, perhaps even who knows, <laughs> who knows, but um, I just want to say again that uh, thanks for all your support for uh, Vanderbilt. Um, thanks in many cases for you, you know, both being alums or sending your children here. Um, I continue to be just so impressed by the students. I've been making efforts as Dean to visit various classrooms. And you know, learning's going on. It's not the way we want it. As, as John said earlier, we'd much rather be in person, um, but we're working with what we've got and, and making it work quite successfully, partly because John, John and I have tried to bring in some speakers um, to class to enliven things, uh, but these students are amazing. And it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be able to be part of their, their lives for these four, these four years. And thanks again to all of you for your for your amazing support. And I guess we'll have one more post-election uh, webinar to kind of take stock of where everything stands. Uh, and- Great, you know, great. Yeah, exactly. So in any case, be safe, be well, and uh, thanks again. And thanks you, Professor Meacham. Uh, we teach in half an hour, don't we? Uh, we do indeed. Well, 45 minutes. All Same right. place, Vandy alum is uh, coming, to, coming to class run CNN News Desk. Um, and so he will have some uh, wisdom to share with our, with our eager young minds. Thank you. Bye-bye.